religious society of friends was nicknamed the Quakers because they were thought to quake or tremble at the name of the Lord. Thomas Sowell has studied and taught economics, intellectual history, and social policy at institutions that include Cornell, Brandeis, UCLA, and Amherst. Now a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, Dr. Sowell has published more than a dozen books, including the classic A Conflict of Visions. Coming soon, a revised edition of his most recent volume, Discrimination and Disparities. Tom Sowell, welcome. Thank you. You grew up in Harlem, dropped out of high school to join the Marine Corps during the Korean War, received an undergraduate degree from Harvard, a master's from Columbia, and your doctorate from the University of Chicago, all of which pales by comparison with the fact that you once tried out for the Brooklyn Dodgers. <laughs> but during this period from Harlem to the University of Chicago, Throughout your 20s, you've said, you spent most of the decade of your 20s as a Marxist. Yes. Why? What was, a, what, what was the attraction? Well, I guess I first was, was uh, very puzzled. See, you, you, there, there's one little correction I would make. Uh, uh, at age 16, I was a dropout, high school dropout. Uh, and I went to work full time as a Western Union messenger. Uh, and uh, delivering telegrams. Delivering telegrams. We better say that because there will be a generation that won't know what Western Union was. But go yeah, ahead. that's true too. Right. right. Uh, and so I, 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 wor I worked in the area, area of Manhattan called the Chelsea District, which is around 23rd Street, 9th Avenue. And at the end of the day, I had uh, several ways of getting back home. I, the easiest and fastest way was with a subway, which was a nickel in those days. When I was feeling flush, I might go for a bus or for a dime. And then when I was really getting reckless, I, I would take the Fifth Avenue bus, which was the elite of the buses, uh, for, it was 15 cents. And so I would walk over to Fifth Avenue and take that bus. And it would take me up uh, through all the glamorous parts of Fifth Avenue, past the Empire State Building. Uh, and then on 57th Street, it would turn, and, and, and it was, this is just a, the elite part of town. Sure, right, right there where the park starts. Yes, and then and you, fi, fi, no, the park starts at 59th. Oh, sorry. 50, 57th, I would turn over, again, the same kind of scene, past Carnegie Hall, right. uh, Columbus Circle, there was no Trump Tower at that time, and uh, on up to about 72nd Street, and go out to 50. Have, uh, out to the Riverside Drive, which is another elite area. So for miles after that, you'd have all these wonderful luxury apartment buildings and so on. And finally, around 129th or 30th Street, uh, it would go on a long viaduct. And then it would do a right turn back into the occupied area, and there you'd see the tenements. And I would wonder, why is this? I mean, why, why, why this huge disparity? And there was nobody else. There was no other other explanation around. There, there was nothing. There was nothing there other than Marxism. Uh, and I, I stumbled across. I had not read Marx, but I, 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 I bought a secondhand pair, of, a set of uh, encyclopedias, small set, for some ridiculously low price. And uh, there, they, I looked up Karl Marx. I'd heard the name. And the stuff that he said seemed to make sense. And then later on, I would get more and more into it. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the argument was that the, the rich had gotten rich by taking from the poor. Right. And well, that, that, was, that was one explanation. But what is interesting, there was no other explanation out there, really. And that's true largely in our, our, our colleges and universities today. But so, so by the time you went to Harvard undergrad, well, so wait, you drop out at the age of 16, mm -hmm. And you start reading Marx in your late teens. Uh, no, uh, I start reading Marx, yes, 1940, uh, at age 19. Age 19. And then you were in the Marine Corps for a couple of years. What, what, what was it, two, three years? Uh, two years. It was actually one, one, one year, 11 months, and five days, but who's counting? Who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so by the time you went to Harvard, you had already become intellectually engaged with Marxism. Yes. And remained, and Harvard did talk you out of it, nor did getting a master's at Columbia, nor did getting a doctorate, 
at Chicago oh. dissuade you from Marxism. Is that, and you studied with Milton Friedman of all people. How could you have sat in Milton Friedman's classroom and remained a Marxist? Some people are just stubborn. <laughs> uh, but uh, what, what really changed me uh, was not the University of Chicago. Uh, it was my first job working in a professional capacity for the government. I was a summer intern. This is after Chicago. Or, no, no, while I was still a graduate student. Got it. Uh, and so during the summer vacation, I, I worked in the US Department of Labor. And I began to realize, for a number of things, that the government is not simply the personification of the general will, like uh, Rousseau or, or others. The government is an institution. The government institutions have their own institutional uh, interests. Uh, one involved the minimum wage law. I was a big supporter of that, but I also knew that there was an argument that minimum wage laws simply price low wage workers out of a job. <laughs> And uh, the, uh, my, uh, my first assignment was, with, was a, dealt with minimum wages in Puerto Rico. And as I looked at the numbers, I would see as they would jack up the minimum wages, the number, number of jobs would go down and so forth. But there were two explanations. One was that of the economists that you price the people out of a, out of a job. And the other was that there, are, there were uh, hurricanes that had come to Puerto Rico, you see, during the sugar harvesting. And therefore, and I was studying the sugar industry, and therefore, it destroyed a lot of the crop. Therefore, you wouldn't hire as many workers. Now, in Chicago, I had been taught that if there are two different theories, there should be some, more, some empirical evidence in principle that could distinguish what would happen under one theory from what would happen under the other. And so I wrestled with that for the, most of the summer. And one morning, I came in and I said, I got it. What we need are data on the amount of sugar cane standing in the fields before the hurricane struck. And as I waited for the congratulations, I could see stricken looks around me in the room. Like, this guy has stumbled on something that will ruin us all. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and they said, well, we, we don't have those data. I said, oh, I'll bet the Department of Agriculture has it. And he said, well, well, but we, that doesn't mean we have it. Uh, well, you'd have to have to the Secretary of Labor. He would then confer with the Secretary of Agriculture. It would come down the chain of command and the Department of Agriculture to whoever has those numbers. And so I said, good. Well, they say a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So I will now submit my request to the Secretary of Labor, which I did. And I am still patiently awaiting this <laughs> reply. And the institutional fear of the number was what? That it would... Uh, oh, the U.S. Department of Labor administers the minimum wage law, I and, I, and the uh, uh, money and the careers of perhaps a third or some other significant percentage of the, minimum, of the Labor Department's uh, resources come from administering the minimum wage law. One of the real farces of all this is that the law itself, Section 4D, I still remember, requires the Labor Department to study the employment effects of minimum wages, and those studies are absolutely a farce. Uh, in fact, some years after I left, I did an article saying why those, those uh, studies were a farce. And when I came back later on to the Labor Department to do some research, one of the older librarians who remembered me turned to the younger librarian and she said, this is the man who wrote that article that has everybody up in arms. <laughs> so you became, you began to be dissuaded about, of Marxism. And of government, uh, and of government in general, because the, the, the government uh, is not out there at the personification of, of the national interests. Right. They have their own interests, and the Labor Department was clearly an interest in, in keeping the minimum wage because that's, the, that's their jobs and careers are in power. In your, which brings us, if I may, to one of my favorite books, your 2000 book, this is a beat up old copy, mm -hmm. this book, Conflict of Visions, yes. which you published in 2007, and you lay out, I'm sorry, 1987. I beg your pardon. We reprinted it in 2007. Uh, well, beat up as this book is, <laughs> it turns out this is a reprint. Sorry. 1987. And you lay out two competing ways of looking at economics and policy, really two competing ways of looking at life that go back at least 200 years, the constrained vision and the unconstrained vision. The constrained vision, I'm quoting from A Conflict of Visions, sees the evils of the world as deriving from the limited and unhappy choices available. So the constrained vision under itself, understands itself as constrained by the limitations of reality itself. Yes. Is that, yes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. 
In other words, they cannot prove it. Christine is so many do that good things happen automatically, but bad things are somebody's fault. Quaker. Got it. Got it. And then to continue here, the constrained vision, again, quoting from a conflict of visions, for the amelioration improvement of the human condition, the constrained vision relies on certain social processes such as moral traditions, the marketplace, or families, mm. not government. Mm. So explain that. Why, why do we rely, why do, why do we rely on, so, on processes rather than the will of the people instituting changes to improve our condition? Well, uh, it doesn't ignore government. Uh, uh, even for the market to work, you have to have a government as uh, Europe discovered when the Roman Empire collapsed and the economy has collapsed also. Uh, but I, I guess um, one of the reasons would be that with the government you have surrogate decision makers and they cannot possibly know as much as the individuals whose de personal decisions have been preempted. I see, I see. All right, which brings us to the unconstrained vision. When Again, I'm quoting you. When Rousseau said that man is born free but everywhere in chains, he expressed the essence of the unconstrained vision which the, in which the fundamental problem is not nature or man, but institutions. Yes. Would you explain that one? Well, he has a notion that, uh, again, that, that good things happen naturally. Uh, if they're bad things, it's because uh, institutions, including civilization itself, have, have made these bad things happen. And of course, uh, uh, and I think that that's really the, uh, the, uh, the implicit the assumption behind a lot of things that are said on the left today. Uh, and what, why in my most recent book, I go to a lot of trouble to show that uh, in nature, uh, there's nothing resembling equal opportunity. That wherever you look around the country, around the, around the world, uh, you find people who live up in the mountains, poor and backwards even in the richest country, including the United States. Mm -hmm. I believe the, the poorest country in the United States, county rather, uh, was in a mountain community, uh, which was almost 100% white. Somewhere and, in Appalachia, West Virginia, yes, yeah, Southern yeah, Ohio. Yeah. Or, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the men in that, in that county had a life expectancy 10 years less than men in a, in a county in, in, in Virginia. And the constrained, the unconstrained vision says, let's fix that. We, surely we can pass a law that would improve that. And the constrained vision says, well, now wait a moment. If people who live in isolated pockets in mountains are poor and backwards all around the world, and we see this pattern over and over and over again, maybe there's something very deeply rooted in reality about that that's hard for us to get at. Correct? Yes. All right. So... In the book, A Conflict of Visions, you're very dispassionate and very analytical, and you lay out the unconstrained vision, and you lay out the constrained vision, and you don't really come out blazing in favor of one or the other. No, it, 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 yeah, the, the, that is not a book meant to, meant to uh, show that one vision is, is better than the other. It, it's there to show you what, what they are and what right. you're assuming. If you if you go one direction or another, okay, and it's, it's to encourage people to understand the implicit assumptions behind all this, without which you you you're just at, 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 at loose ends. All right. So, if, pondering all this, I I noticed something a, a column that you wrote. This is a couple of years ago, in which you rebutted Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times, and Kristof had ascribed the gaps between African Americans and whites in America, gaps in wealth, gaps in educational achievement, the usual gaps, mm -hmm. to, and this is a quotation from Christoph, to the lingering effects of slavery, close quote. Oh, yeah. And here's Tom Sowell, quote, if we wanted to be serious about evidence, <laughs> we might compare where blacks stood 100 years after the end of slavery with where they stood after 30 years of the liberal welfare state. In other words, we could compare hard evidence on the legacy of slavery, and so there it is, life is hard. You use the word hard. You, you use the word serious. You use evidence. Tom Sowell is a man of the constrained vision through and through and through, correct? Yes. No, no. Yeah, I, uh, yes, you know, uh, uh, part of a, of a vanishing breed, I might add. So, when, so when you were a Marxist, 
the notion. Explain that because the Mar Marxism. Well, but no, no. You see, yeah, so that's not, even when I was a Marxist, I, I had the same intellectual standards. Right, and, and that, that's what eventually led me away from it. Oh, I see. In other words, I did. I hadn't done all the research. I hadn't gone around the world of, looking, looking for evidence. It. Yes, yes. Okay, so. And so socialism is a great idea. That does not mean it's a great reality. One of the things that, that disturbs me tremendously is about this enthusiasm for Bernie Sanders and socialism at a time when people are literally starving in Venezuela, an oil-rich country. You know, and, and they're, they're, you know, they're breaking into, into grocery stores to try to get food, and they're fleeing to neighboring countries, most of which are not all that prosperous themselves. But, they, but at least you don't starve to death in them. Uh, and, and none of that makes a bit, a bit of difference. I don't think most of these people who are out there cheering for Bernie Sanders have given a thought to Venezuela. To the evidence. That's right. To the evidence, yes. All right. Which brings us to something that you refer to in a number of columns you, as the retrogression, the experience of African Americans in this country. Economic progress, I'm quoting you. Despite the grand myth that black economic progress began or accelerated with the passage of the civil rights laws and the war on poverty programs of the 1960s, the fact is that the poverty rate among blacks fell from 87% in 1940 to 47% in 1960, but over the next 20 years, the poverty rate among blacks fell another 18 percentage points. This was just the continuation of, pre of a previous economic trend, but at a slower rate of progress. It was so not some grand deliverance, close quote. That is so counter to what we are taught, that assertion. Oh, I, 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 I have more evidence in, in my most, most recent book, uh, Discrimination and Disparities. Uh, I point out that this really is a pattern not peculiar to blacks or even to the United States, that you can see the same thing in England, you can see it in any number of other countries that the poor were, were, were much worse off economically, let's say in the first half of the 20th century. And yet, they, in terms of their own behavior, they were, they were, they had, they were far more decent uh, societies. Uh, and, and afterwards, after, after this welfare state that's supposed to make them better off and, and, and better human beings, that's when the crime rate skyrocketed on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, the British were, no, were famous for being perhaps the most polite, considerate society uh, in the world prior to that. Uh, after that, you get things like the 2011 riots over there in right. London, Manchester, where they were they going through this. They, they, they anticipated Ferguson uh, and, uh, and uh, Baltimore by a few years. And the same thing, the, the, the burning down of, of, of buildings, the throwing of gasoline bombs, the, the whole schmear. Uh, and none of those people were descendants of slaves. So, so the poor people were doing, if the, the lesson of the 20th century is something like poor people, including in this country, African Americans, were improving their lot and leading fundamentally decent lives until the government decided to help them. Yeah, yes. That's a, that's a fair statement. Well, they, but by they're, the way, they're, they're better off uh, uh, economically because of all, what's been given. Right. But of course, when you when you have the crime rate, I mean, I, I got I got the first inkling of this some years back when I was uh, uh, at some school in Harlem doing some research, and I looked out the window and I mentioned in passing that when I was a little kid, I used to walk my dog in that park, and looks of horror came over the students' faces. So that Nobody in his right mind would have a child going to that park, walking their dog or not. The principal was warning these students not to cross this park, which is about a block and a half wide. Uh, and, when I, and, and when I tell them about how in his hot summer nights I would sleep out on the fire stage in Harlem, they looked at me like I was a man from Mars. People were doing that all over New York. They were doing it in Philadelphia, Washington, wherever I've known people. That was a common thing for poor people. We didn't have the money for air conditioning. Right. You slept out on, on the fire escape or in the park. Where Walter grew up in a... In a Walter Williams. Uh, Walter Williams grew up in a, uh, 
a housing project in Philadelphia. He was saying on the hot summer nights, the people would be in this project would have to have little balconies. They'd sleep out on the balconies. And the one on the first floor who didn't have balconies would sleep out in the yard. And that there were old men who would, who would see sit on a hot summer night, sitting outdoors into the wee hours playing cards or, uh, or checkers or whatever. It was a different world. Mm -hmm. 